You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. And in this podcast, we're gonna be listening in on the messages from the Maximize Manhood Men's Conference. In this session, we'll hear from Senior Pastor of Crossroads Church in Maryland, Dave Marsh. Man, it is a true honor to be with you this weekend. I love this church, love your pastor, love all the staff, love this region. I grew up down the road just a few miles in Mononga, and I will always, always have a special place in my heart for this area, and I always have a special place in my belly for hot dogs, colacesinos, and steak hoagies like you can only get in the hills of West Virginia. Somebody say amen. And I pray that this weekend is going to be significant in all of our lives. I pray that we're going to be inspired over these next couple of days. But more than just inspiration, I pray that we'll be changed, changed from the inside out. Anybody ready for God to do just a fresh work? Just a fresh work in you. Come on, are you ready? Ready to maybe just groan a little tired of same old, same old. Any brothers in the house who would say, preacher, if I'm honest, it's a long time since God did something new in me. If that's you, would you stand to your feet? Raise your hands. Go ahead. Do it right now. Stand to your feet. Just raise your hands. And let's pray. Let's pray right now. Our Father, we've come into this place Not just to shout, not just to sing, but Lord, we've come to encounter you. God, it is you who called us. It is you who started a good work in us. God, some of us in this place 50 years ago, you put your finger on our lives. Some of us, it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, you put your hand on our hearts and you started a work in us. But God, we're not satisfied for what you started 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. God, we need a fresh touch from our Father's hand. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to come into this place and do what we cannot do in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own experience. God, we need a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit to sweep through this place over these next few days and change us from the inside out, God. The work that you started, you said you're faithful to complete. And God, I believe that starting tonight and through tomorrow that you are going to show up and show off. And God, you are going to work deep down on the inside of us, your sons, and make us more like Jesus than we've ever been before. If that's you, would you say amen? Father, we thank you. Hey, we're going to get into God's word, and I really want to talk to you about three things that I believe God is looking for in his sons. Three things, they all start with the letter C, and it just helps me remember, and I hope it helps you remember. We're going to talk about courage tonight, and talk about clarity, and then we're going to talk about a word that nobody seems to talk about nowadays, consecration. Courage, clarity, and consecration. Our Bible text this evening is going to take us back to the life of an Old Testament king, a guy by the name of Asa. We're going to begin with a prophecy spoken to King Asa, and I believe that this prophecy will also speak to us this weekend. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Second Chronicles chapter 15 is where we're going to begin in our Bibles. And verse one, it says, now the spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, And he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Now watch this. Here's the prophetic word. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. This prophecy becomes like a banner over Asa's life. The prophecy again says, The Lord is with you while... You are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. My brothers, in this one prophecy, we have a tremendous promise, but we also have an ominous warning. The promise is if we seek God, if we walk with him, he is going to walk with us. But if we forsake him, he will forsake us. Somebody say amen Amen. and ouch. (laughs) You get both in one prophecy. There's an amen. There's a yes, Lord. But there's an oh me. (laughs) There's there's an ouch. There's a God. Uh, Help me, don't. 
Help me not to forsake you. Help me to keep walking with you all the days of my life. You see, I want to talk about Asa a little bit. He was born into a royal family. His father was a king, but a sinful one. He also had a very high profile grandmother. She was the queen, but a very immoral woman. Asa is born into political royalty, but spiritual poverty. And in some ways, the culture of Asa's day looks a lot like our nation today. You see, we now live in what we would call a post-Christian America. For many years, our nation was upheld by Judeo-Christian values. Now, that doesn't mean everyone in our nation was Christ-like or that our nation was perfect. Doesn't mean that at all. We had and have our share of sins. But in spite of those sins, many people in our nation subscribe to a common set of values that help shape our sense of right and wrong, good and evil, moral and immoral. It was a time in our nation that you could turn on the television and any, you could watch any channel you wanted to, you would not hear profanity. It was a time that if they showed a master bedroom, it had two twin beds in it, implying that husbands and wives slept separately. Now, I know some of you men right now say, wait a minute, my wife told me that all husbands and wives sleep separately. That's a different sermon, brother. <laughs> Yes, twin beds in the master bedroom on TV was kind of silly, but today, today we've gone to the other extreme. And we have Nickelodeon using drag queens to disciple our kids on things like gender and sexuality. The people producing content for our families today are not just actors, they are activists. And their goal is not to just entertain, but to indoctrinate. And frankly, they're doing a really, really, really good job at it. We're living in a culture where we're not only dwelling in darkness, but we are celebrating darkness puffed up with our own pride. And Isaiah 5 and verse 20 said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Our young people are literally growing up in a culture where this culture will look at good and they'll go, you know what? That's evil. And then they will look evil directly in the eyes and go, you know what? That's good. And if you happen to question their judgment, you will be labeled as the radical one. <laughs> are there any men of God in the house who are tired of seeing our families bombarded by the demonic and the profane? I am. I'm tired of it. Well, King Asa is living in a day similar to ours where there's spiritual confusion and it's running the show, but God has his hand upon this man and he calls him to bring change to the nation of Israel and even in his own family. If we were to look tonight at where Asa came from, you might think that Asa is destined to follow in his family's footsteps, but here's what I love about God. When you seek him, you are not destined to repeat the mistakes of your family. You do not have to follow in their footsteps. You have a choice. You're not powerless. As you seek God, he can turn you from being a follower to a trailblazer, and you can lead the next generation into a godly heritage. Any men in the house that believe God can change your family tree, and he can use you to do it. I do, I do. Listen, I grew up in this area. And Pastor Junius, if, if you wanted to find my dad, if you want to find David Lee Marsh Sr. on a Friday night, you wouldn't come to Jewel City Church. You'd go to Dar Darway's uh, uh, bar. You, you'd, you'd, you'd go to, you know, every hole in the wall. You'd go to the dip. You'd go to the town pump. Y'all, my baby dedication was in the town pump. Listen, you wouldn't find David Lee Marsh Sr. in church at a men's conference uh, on a Friday night. But I'm here to tell you that what started with your granddaddy and what started with your dad and maybe is on your grandma and your aunts and your uncle, it does not have to continue in your life. I, I got to baptize my grandson last week. David Lee Marsh IV at seven years of age walked into the waters of baptism and I pray that he will never know the sin my my daddy knew and he'll never know the sin that I knew God's looking for just some men just some men 
that he can use to change your family tree. And by the way, my dad is saved today at 96 years of age. He's been redeemed by the same blood that has redeemed me and my grandson. The prophet comes to Asa, he says, Asa, the Lord is with you while you're with him. And Asa, he hears the word. You ever got a word from God? I'm telling you, if you got a word from God, you can't shake it. You can't forget. You might, you could try. You can't forget about it. It sticks with you. And Asa receives the word of God and it weighs heavy on him. And he begins to take action. Look at 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 8. It says, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, it said, he took courage. Everyone say, he took courage. Hear me, men, if we want to follow Jesus in our day, we got to be rebels to culture. We got to be rebels to culture. It's going to take courage to look into the eyes of evil and call it evil because there will be a price to pay. Oh, you can keep your mouth shut. <laughs> And you can let your God and your values be mocked and you probably won't face much opposition. But if you choose to speak truth to lies, you will be persecuted. You will face opposition on the job and in the school and on social media. Men, we need to, we need to take courage to even lead within our own families. You know, it takes courage to lead your wife and your children. Sometimes they don't understand when you say no. Sometimes when you, they don't understand your leading. Sometimes they don't understand when the Holy Spirit has said something to you and, and you say, honey, I can't explain it. My daughter, I can't explain it. My son, I can't explain it. But I just don't feel like God wants us to go down that road. And sometimes they look at you like you're crazy. It takes courage to look into the eyes of those you love, especially if you're married to a mean woman. Come on, somebody. <laughs> somebody say, take courage. Over the past few years, a spirit of fear has gripped our nation. And everywhere you look, we would see signs that say, stay safe. Stay safe. Three steps to stay safe. People would, in conversation, you'd be walking away, Scott, is, hey, stay safe. End a text or an email, hey, stay safe. And I know we're just trying to keep people from getting sick, my brothers, but spiritually speaking, God has not called any of us to stay safe. He has called us to take courage. Men of God need courage. And Asa, he took it. Verse eight, look at it again. It says, and when Asa heard the words of the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage. And watch what he did. He removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. This young king took courage. He went through all the land destroying all these false idols. And he called the people back to repentance. He restored true worship to God. You see, the nation of Israel was sinful and proud of it. They didn't even try to hide their sins. They would sin in the streets and even build monuments to their sin. And everyone just went along with it. Everyone was afraid to say, I ain't going to say anything. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't need that trouble. Listen, I, I'm, I'm a leader. I'm a pastor of a church. I don't need people, you know, coming against me. I got a business. I'm in the community. I'm a coach. I'm a this, I'm a that. I, I'm a teacher. I'm a principal. I don't want to stir anything up. No courage. No courage. Fear. Asa took courage. He took it. And he went around and he tore down all these idols and he called people back to repentance. He knew it was going to cost him something, even in his own family, and he did it anyway. In our day of darkness, God is looking for people to light up the darkness, not celebrate it. Not celebrate it. And even if no one in your family is loyal to God, your heart can be loyal to God. Even if everyone else in your family glorifies sin, you can still choose to live in holiness. It took courage and he had clarity in a sea of confusion. My brothers, when, when you're in a culture like ours, moral and spiritual confusion is everywhere. And you know what the world is trying to do? The world is trying to make us ashamed for what we believe in. They're trying to make us ashamed for what we believe in. Meanwhile, they can't even tell you what a woman is. 
We got men wearing bras and women trying to look like men and no one knows what bathroom to use. The woman of the year is actually a man. What? The world is confused. And in a sea of confused people, God needs some men who will stand up with the voice of moral clarity and speak truth wrapped in love. Men, the future is determined by conviction. Do you know who wins wars? The side that wants it bad. <laughs> the, the side that is willing to lay down their lives, lay down their fortunes, sacrifice, that the side with the most passion wins. And we got to be men of conviction. And even when opposition comes and persecution comes, what, in the, what kind of world are we living in where like we crumble like a cheap deck of cards if someone hurts our feelings? Hurts our feelings. People like that, I'm thinking, surely you did not grow up with big brothers. Because <laughs> I, I grew up with big brothers who beat me daily. It wasn't about hurting my feelings. It was trying to make it out of mom's house alive. Anyone else have any big brothers? <laughs> People say, that hurt my feelings. Don't say that. You could say anything you want to me. My brothers would stomp me before breakfast just for fun, just to stir up their appetite. He <laughs> says, a man willing to confront the lies of his day. I mentioned his grandma several times. Let's take a closer look at grandma. His grandma, when I read, when I read this about Asa many years ago, when I first read this chapter. I was like, what in the world? Grandma did this? Grandma made an obscene image to the fertility goddess Asherah. She erected a pole in public where perverse sexual practices would be done as an act of worship. That's his grandma. I thought my grandma was bad because she rubbed snuff. His grandma is a pole dancer. I mean, what in the world? Come on, you're from West Virginia, most of you. Don't be acting like your granny didn't have square snuff. You know she had it. She rubbed snuff and, and, and peeled potatoes all at the same time. <laughs> you always wondered what was in the gravy. <laughs> Verse 16 says, also he removed Makah, that's the grandmother of Asa the king, from being queen mother because she had made an, an obscene image of Asherah. Asa cut down her obscene image, watch this now, crushed it and burned it by the brook Kidron. This brother ain't playing with sin. He says, Mama, I'm sorry, but I cannot participate in your sin and I cannot permit you to continue it. He removes her from public office. He cuts down her pole. He crushes it and he burns it. <laughs> Can you imagine how much pressure? I know we're here preaching about something that happened thousands of years ago, years ago, but you got a grandma. You got a mom. You got a wife. Can you imagine how much pressure he was under to just, hey, Asa, let it go. Asa, come on. It's Mama. She's been like this. You know how long she's been like this. Asa, she ain't got that many years left. Don't, Asa. <laughs> just, just leave it alone. She'll be dead in a few years. Then you can take the pole down. But don't say anything about the pole. We all live with women. We know the pressure. And this brother said, Mama, it's coming down. He crushed it. He burned it. I bet a lot of people said, you know what? That pole's been there for years. Everyone's doing it. Everyone says it's okay. It seems right. Someone may have said, who are you to judge, Asa? Who are you? Asa was a man of God, therefore he had a responsibility to judge. And with something was evil, he had to call it evil even when grandma was doing it. 
My brothers, if we're going to protect ourselves and our families from the deception and confusion of our day, we must be men of clarity. We must be able to look into the realm of the spirit and say, you know what? That's evil. That's sin. That's darkness. No, we, I can't go for that. No, no, no. Uh -uh. No, we're not going to do that in our family. We're not going to do that in our house. Nope, we're not watching that. Nope, we're not going to do it. We got to be able to have that moral clarity. And the only way to do that is to be filled with the word of God. We're living in a day where one sermon a week, it ain't enough anymore. We're living in a day, it's not enough to say, you know what, I'm gonna go to church and ask my pastor. You know, you got a good pastor, but you better know for yourself. Every man in this room needs to be a student of God's word. You need to know what, what God's word says about gender. You need to know what God's word says about marriage, what it says about money, what it says about sexuality. We need to know for ourselves. And when our kids or our grandkids come home from school confused, you need to take out your Bible, sit them down, and you be the voice of moral clarity in your family. Go ahead, tell someone tonight, you be the voice. You be the voice. It's not someone else. You're going to call somebody else, not your wife. It's you, man of God. Asa came from a horrible family, but you know what his name means? It means a lamp in Jerusalem. God said, I'm going to take you out of that awful family that you grew up in. And I'm going to make you a light, a lamp in Jerusalem. And here's the deal, my brothers. Asa was not the only one called to be a lamp. We share his call. God didn't just want to raise up a lamp in Jerusalem. He wanted to raise up a lamp in Shenston and in Bridgeport and in Oakland and this whole region. God has put a call upon his sons. He's calling us to be men who take courage. He's calling us to be men who bring clarity. I got one more C. But in order to do those things, we have to be men who are fully consecrated to God. Consecrated means set apart. It means living holy lives. You see, you and I cannot boldly stand up for what is right if we ain't living right. You, you, didn't, you didn't hear me or you ignored me or you pretend like you didn't hear me. One of the greatest strategies of the enemy right now is to get us to live loose lives. And when we lose the moral high ground, who are we to speak out against immorality if we ourselves are being immoral? Let me say it this way. Who are we to speak out against drag queen story hour when our phones are filled with pornography? Who are we to speak out against Pride Month when we're not living in purity? Take courage. Yes. <laughs> Be the voice of truth. Yes. Be fully consecrated to God. Crickets. <laughs> My brothers. In order for us to walk in courage and clarity, we must be living consecrated lives. Holiness. I know it's an old-fashioned word. I know not many people preach it anymore, but God calls us to holiness. First Timothy 2 and verse 8, he says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up what? Holy hands. That means God wants the work of these hands to be holy. In Exodus 3 and 5, when, when Moses has this experience with God at the burning bush, what does, what does God say to Moses? He says, Moses, take off your sandal for you. You're close to me. You're standing on holy ground. God, God's saying, Moses, you want to walk with me? You're going to have to walk in holiness. Romans 16 and verse 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. First of all, if any of you brothers try that on me this weekend. <laughs> 
<laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> There's going to be trouble. But what's it mean? Greet one another with a holy kiss. It means that the words of our mouth, what we're doing with these mouths, what we're doing with these lips ought to be holy. Second Timothy 1 and verse 9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Scripture tells us over and over again, when we are born again, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And repeatedly, God our Father says this, be ye holy, for I am holy. Psalm 15 verse 1 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Who? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. My brothers, everything about our God is holy Therefore, his sons ought also be holy. I recently counseled a man who had been carrying on an affair, an affair for five years. Five years. Five years of lies. Five years of pretending. Five years of cheating on his wife on Saturday, but showing up for worship on Sunday. Five years of hypocrisy. I'm not talking about you. He's not here, okay? Everyone lighten up. I mean, unless the Lord's talking about you. But I'm just saying, every Saturday night, for five years, he goes and sees his girlfriend, gets home late, lays down beside his wife, Alarm clock goes off on Sunday morning, gets the kids out of bed, walks into church, and lifts up hands to God for five years. How is that brother going to speak out against immorality? How is that brother going to be a lamp in his Jerusalem? counseled another man who's a leader in his church. He almost lost his marriage because he would not let go of a pornography addiction. Just would not let it go. Counseled another brother who put his job at risk because he won't stop getting drunk. Just won't stop. How's he going to speak out against anything? How's he going to light up the world? Counseled another brother engaged to a beautiful woman. But, but now he might lose her because she found messages on his phone flirting with other women while he's engaged to her. This woman is about to fully give herself to him, but he won't stop flirting with sin. How's God going to use him to light up his Jerusalem? How's that brother going to be a lamp in darkness? God is saying to us, his sons, yes, I want to use you to light up the culture. Yes, I want to use you to make a difference in this darkness. Yes, I want you to be men of courage. Yes, I want you to be that voice of clarity. But if we're going to be used by God, we have to be totally consecrated to him. We have to be living holy lives. I myself... I'm a sinful, broken man. Therefore, I've got all the compassion in the world for my brothers caught up in sin. But I also believe that God is saying to us, his sons, that if we want to be used by him, that it's time that we forsake our sins and pursue holiness with everything within us. At the start of this message, many of us stood and we lifted hands and we asked God to do a fresh work in us. This is the work. He's calling us to be set apart. Calling us to be consecrated. Calling us to lay down anything that would stand in the way of his will for our lives. My brothers, here's what I want to do tonight. I want us to gather together. I want us to take a moment. I want you... Come up front. We can all fit up here. I know guys in the back, you've been resistant, but I don't believe you're going to come. And here's what I'm saying. 
It's our first session. We've got speakers tomorrow. We're going to have a great time. Why don't we take the first part of this conference and just say, God, I want to consecrate myself to you afresh and anew. I don't want to hold on to anything over these next couple of days. They're going to keep me from receiving all that you have for me. Brothers, would you come and join me at this altar? Would you come and lift up holy hands? Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m.